Okay, tonight we'll talk a little bit about troubleshooting. And this lesson, talking about troubleshooting, kind of depends on you think about what we've done up to this point. And I say that because you need to take a modular approach. This is me, a modular approach to troubleshooting. What element isn't working? You push the button and it doesn't come on. What's the problem? No power. In the power. So it's in the power area. You don't have a picture. The video doesn't work. It's in the video area. So these things, think of them in a modular context. And once you figure out what area isn't working, that's what you need to attack. And I think they do, and I'll pick on Josh again. They ask you, you've done this. What's your next step? They ask those next step questions. No to troubleshooting, the CompTIA troubleshooting process, which I think is on your Moodle page, which is six steps, I think. So they do like to ask that. You've done, you have a problem, and this is what you did. This is the last thing you did. What's the next step in the troubleshooting process? So look at those. The objectives, learn how to approach and solve a computer problem related to hardware, especially when the problem occurs during boot. When the problem occurs during boot, during the post, you're probably going to get an error message. You are going to get an error message. You may get a Morse code signal before the video kicks in to help you to resolve what's going on. The Morse code, the, the beep codes, and the beep codes are all different for different BIOSes. When you say, well, what does this one mean? It depends on what the BIOS is. You just got to look those up. Happens before the video card gets checked, and it's there and it's working. Which means that, and I want to go back to last block during the day class, a student went to an interview. And he didn't get the job. And one of the questions was, he, what, ooh, he did get the job. Ooh, that's ooh, not ooh. Anyhow, they, one of the questions was, there's no signal to the monitor. What's the problem? Well, what are the possibilities of it? First of all, is it all on computer? Uh, does, does it matter? Plug it up. Uh, Plug it up. What, could, what are some of the problems that it could be? Monitor plugged in? No, say what? The graphics card not set up in the BIOS. I don't think that's really a possibility because once it gets through post, it's checked to be sure that video is there. And he kept going back to video card. I think that once you get through post, video card's been checked, and you sh so that's you have, one that you're probably not going to have. If you have the bias come up, but uh, the, once the bias goes away, you have no graphical could, interface. It could be right. a bad connector. Could be a bad connector. Could be a bad cable. Could be a bad power. One of the ones that students used to love to do is just turn down the intensity. Oh, uh, don't forget about that one. Well, basic things. Is it on? I mean, you can usually tell if it's a signal because the monitors will tell you if they, they've got the, the signal lights tell you you have a signal, no signal. No signal, let's look and see. Back to the video cars, the cable good. Uh, they get unplugged a little bit. And going back to, you've looked at, read about the voltages. And the voltages on these things are not real high, are they? which means we're not going to have a whole big current. So if you have a little bit of corrosion, anybody ever had a corrosion on your battery on your car? Yeah. They don't really do that a whole lot anymore, but it won't start, right? All right, after a while, yeah. After a while? Because it drains it. We, get a, uh, we can get, in certain circumstances, a, a similar thing that happens here. So what is it? What element of the entire cycle are we talking about when we talk about these things. And you get a lot, you get error, error signals, and you guys that have these high-powered machines, was it Josh and AJ, have these high-powered machines, right? 
Is there a postcard on your video on your uh, motherboard? Huh? Is there a postcard? Not a postcard that you send in the mail, but a power on self test card. No. One that goes through the error messages. No. Way back in like chapter one or two or whatever, we talked about a postcard. Which you can plug into the system and it will record for you the errors that happen during the power on self test. That can help you out too. Once you get, if Windows starts up, there's a number of tests that you can run, lots of softwares to test the components, uh, what's going on in there also. One of the things, we're going to have some pictures here in a little bit, is capacitors that kind of wear out. They pop, they they rupture, and you get oil out of them typically, and they'll, they'll expand. They, they really do rupture. They really kind of blow up. And that affects power because the capacitors are on the motherboard to maintain an even power level. That, that's one of the things that they do. That's why they're capacitors. They have a, capaci a capacity to store electricity to keep it at a steady state. Learn how troubleshooting problems with the electrical system, how to troubleshoot problems with the electrical system. That probably, except for... The hard drive, that's the, the, except, the hard drive is really the only mechanical thing in this whole system, isn't it? I think. And now if you have an SSD, even that's not mechanical, but not everybody's gone to SSDs. CD drives, CD drives yeah. We'll, cons we'll consider those together, you're right. CD, CDs and hard drives, mechanical systems, everything else is going to be related to the electrical system, which is going to go back to... Power supply, well-regulated power on the motherboard. The problem with the electrical issues in a lot of cases is they're erratic. If something doesn't work, it's relatively easy to troubleshoot. If something works sometimes, it's really kind of a pain to troubleshoot. It's not kind of a kind of a pain. It is a pain to troubleshoot. So things that are not consistent, not reproducible, Will tend to cause you more headaches than most of the, most of the other things that we do. How to troubleshoot problems that occur during post before video is active, and that's we want to set up a couple of things so you can hear what these power on self test uh, beep codes are all about. Or how to troubleshoot messages that occur during the post, and these these are. Similar occur to pub errors that occur during messages. Messages. These messages would be ones that appear on the screen after the video is active. You can get post errors there, also. A post card will record the errors. Now I think we talked about early on. The guy in the last class had the 78-pound computer yeah. with a really fancy two video cards, two $600 or whatever they were video cards. Yeah. Bought him some new memory and put it in, and all of a sudden his computer didn't work. The issue at that point in time kind of was he changed the video cards and the memory at the same time. The video cards had a higher power requirement than the ones that he replaced. Yeah. Brown out pretty much. Well, you would think so. What, you troubleshoot this thing, right? You would tend to, because the more power, and it became erratic. Sometimes it'd go through post. Sometimes it wouldn't go through post. Sometimes it'd start. Sometimes it wouldn't start. Sometimes it'd run for a little while and shut down. And those are all indications of a power problem. Except when we start, brought it in and they started troubleshooting it over in the knot, took the memory out and reseated it. It worked great. Well, they found that one because this motherboard did have a power on self-test postcard in it. And it came up with an error message telling them exactly what was wrong. All you had to do was go look it up in the book. He had not done that. But those things, they typically will tell you what's going on with them. Uh, did he build his own? He, I don't know if he built it. He kind of built his own. Some of the stuff he takes to one of the local computer shops to put components in, some of the some of the times he puts it in himself. In this case, he put in his own memory. It appeared to be seated when you pushed on it. 
snapped in, take it out, put it back in, seated better, system worked fine. So the moral to that story, I think, is when you do these things, do them one at a time. Because now you put in two video cards and two new RAM chips, you got four components that could be the issue. Do one thing at a time. It may seem like it's the long way, but in many cases it's going to wind up saving you time. Like five cases, everything's just going to work fine. Guy that Josh knows and I know that sits next to me, when he troubleshoots a machine that somebody brings in says it's not working, the first thing he does is take everything out of the computer and then put the components in one at a time. The last component that you put in when it doesn't work, that's your problem. <clears throat> Unless you've overloaded the power supply or something like that. But troubleshooting is something that you just have to practice and you really need to be methodical about it. Don't try don't try to rush it because if you try to rush it you're probably gonna slow yourself down when you do these things. Learn how to troubleshoot problems with motherboard processor and RAM. They have a number of stories in the book about somebody did this or somebody did that. Bad motherboard. Went out and bought a brand new motherboard. Put it in and burn it up too. Because the problem was the power supply. Ah. So another one where the guy put it in and arcing and sparking. Built his own. This was a built his own. He forgot to do something really basic, which was to put the standoffs in the case, so he had mounted the motherboard on the middle of the case. Amen. Fantastic. That's well, whatever the motherboard costs. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's what it costs him. I mean, you figure you bought, yeah. So, once you get, once you smoke these things, they usually don't work very well. We used to have an instructor that said, once you let the smoke out, you might as well go buy a new one. There's only so much smoke in these components. So those things. Motherboard processor, RAM. One of the things in the Windows world that probably will help you with the operation of your computer is going to be RAM. Because regardless of how much RAM you put in it, they want more. I tell you, we got this server back here. It's got 96 gig, and it still wants to have a page file. 96 gig of RAM, and I need a page file to swap things in and out of memory. Unlikely. So, what goes on with these things? And RAM, RAM's one of the post problems. I tell you something. So, we're going to we're, so that you see these things. RAM's one of the post problems I want you to see and hear when you, when we do these things. How to troubleshoot hard drive problems. What kind of going to be your indications of hard drive problems? Noise. Noise. They used to have what we would call the Western Digital Clunk. When it clunked, clunk, clunk, you might as well just go buy a new one. There's, there's those when you, as soon as you start to read, it's like... Yeah, if it makes all sorts of noises, whines, if it's erratic, won't boot. On and on and on and on and on. When you shake it, sounds like Rice Krispies. When you shake it, it sounds like Rice Krispies. That's really not a good thing. That's one if it's out of warranty, you really want to take it apart and see what happened, right? To see what, what the components are in there. But hard drive problems, if it is an issue with it just won't boot, you may be able to take it out of the machine and put it in another machine and, and recover your data. If... It's lost its partitioning information, then you can go back and think about that in DOS. And this is one I've told you I recovered a 250 gig hard drive that lost its partitioning information, had nothing in the directory. But the information was still there. Well, somebody said one time it's like carrying a bucket of water, except the bucket disappeared. The water is still there, it's just not organized anymore. So you may be able to go back as long as the disk will spin and it actually turns and it can be detected by the BIOS. You may be able to get one of these softwares, and there's a multitude of them out there 
that you can recover the data. If you have a dynamic disk, and for those of you who have done the RAID lab, you've converted them to dynamic disk. If you take a dynamic disk out of one Windows machine and put it in another Windows machine, it's going to show up as a foreign disk. Now, this is a really tough one. You know how you fix a foreign disk? You give it a drive letter? You right click on it and say import foreign disk. It's really tough. Most Windows things are really not all that complex, but you just have to know that they're there. Because if you don't know to do that to a foreign disk, you can run around until you get on Google forever and say, what am I going to do with this thing? Mm -hmm. How to troubleshoot problems with monitoring video, and we kind of talked about that a little bit. If the video card goes through post, it's probably working. Then we can look at the other elements that may be going on with this thing. Cables being unplugged, people tripping over them, uh, power power cables are things that we really don't think a whole lot about most of the time, but those things can be bad too. They can be not fitted properly because when you have a standard, when you build things, they build them with tolerances, right? And the tolerance says here's the minimum size and here's the maximum size. So what if we have the plug, the female end, that's the maximum size, and the pins are the minimum size, you may or may not make contact. So you have to be aware of things like that. Do they fit properly? Are they really plugged in? Just looking at them doesn't always, doesn't always do it. Sometimes you've got to actually touch it. Unplug it, plug it back in. Maybe one of those things that it just didn't connect the first time. The how to approach the problem. First, interview the customer. And again, you've got to go back. You have to do your own customer service thing. But interview the customer. And for us, that can sometimes be difficult. Because what are you going to say? Hey, Matt, what'd you do? What'd you do? What's the matter with you? What's the matter <laughs> with you? Yeah. And it goes, oh, nothing. I just turned it on. All I did was turn it on. That's going to be the answer you get. I would say probably 80% of the time. Huh? I just turned it on. I didn't do anything. Yeah. 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 Oh, house, yeah. 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 And there's a sign right by the counter. Yeah. And they always say yes. And they're not. And then he's like, you have 220 updates pending. Yeah. That is one issue. With Windows updates, you really, with Windows, you really need to keep those things up to date. With Linux, you need to keep them up to date also. Yeah, there were a bunch of them. I saw that last night. I think last night when I shut down, there was a bunch of them that were installing. I, I, didn't, I didn't sit to watch to see how many there were. I just said, okay, I'll go ahead and do it. But auto update, that used to be one of the things that they say, oh, no, dude, that's dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. One of the things to consider on your auto updates, on servers you may not want them to install automatically because you may have some software that it affects. Try it on a lab machine that's similarly configured, and that's, one of the places that virtual machines really come in as a, as a huge advantage. You can try this stuff out. And you can configure virtual machines with a thing called undo disk, which means you do something to it and it screws it up, and then you just say, oh, throw that away. Well, snapshot, that, yeah, snapshots now, that's, that's, yeah. That's the current term, the correct term now is snapshot. Yes? There's one program update that I read about That was one that they did, and then they fixed it. Yeah, but they've 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 since done a. I, I remember I read, read that one too a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. yeah, but they 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 updated the update, and that happens. Uh, unintended consequences. We're always going to have those, but when you do these things, kind of think through what you're going to do with them, what you're not going to do with them. Snapshot allows you to go back to some point in time with these things. So the first step is interview the customers, the questions, can you describe the problem, when did it start, and when does it occur? 
When did it start? Oh, when I turned the computer on today. Mm. And that's all I did. Did you install any software? No. Mm. Did you open anything that was sent to you in the email? I think Josh had some fun with creating one of those last night. Oh, yeah. We created a Trojan. No, I never didn't do any of that. Never did any of that virus stuff. Windows, I hate to say it, Vista on up really helps you out a lot with those. Windows 7, we'll say, uh, with the user account control. Do you want to do that? Was the computer recently moved? Why would we worry about it being recently moved? Lose parts? Yes. I know that when you turn an Xbox like from its side up, sometimes the disk drive has yeah. changed. Computers are the same way. You should, when you format a hard drive, if you're going to set it on its side, you should format it on its side. If you're going to set it flat, you should format it flat. So when you do that, it can affect what goes on with it. Did you plug it into a wall switch that's on a or in a in an outlet that's on a wall switch and that's used to be on these things somewhere there's a whole story about the server crashes every day at 4 30. Mm -hmm. when they turn the lights off and go home the server crashes hopefully we don't go through that anymore because we're smart enough to use UPSs on servers and things like that but what are we going to do was it was it recently moved was any new hardware or software recently installed the moving, this could be environmental also, as well as things, the loose parts, jiggling the hard drive, uh, making it crash while it's running, those sorts of things. But environmental conditions, recently moved, is it now sitting right up against a wall so that the computer can't breathe, that you can't ventilate it? Did you move it from a 60 degree knock to a 98 degree uh, room someplace. Break room. Oh. Break room. Wow. Uh, warehouse. In a warehouse. A warehouse is not going to be hot, it's going to be dirty. So you have to pay attention to those for dirt, dust, as well as temperature, ventilating these things. What's going to go on with those there? Was the new hardware or software? That's kind of, kind of self evident, I think. Was any software reconfigured or upgraded? And I think the answer is that you don't really know anymore. Because how many times did you start your browser and it says, well, your upgrade's been installed for you. Thank you very much. When the last time you started Windows and it said, oh, your upgrade has been installed for you. Thank you very much. Or Linux and your upgrade's been installed for you. Thank you very much. These are things that you would know about, but a lot of stuff gets upgraded when you don't know about it. When you get into an enterprise environment, the Windows updates at least, you can manage with what's called a Windows uh, software update server so that you approve, you the network administrator approve when these things actually, what gets installed and when it gets installed. And that's one that, do you want to try it out? If you've got, if you've got 5,000 computers that you're going to have updated, upgraded, you really would not like to have 5,000 computers fail today so that you have a really long weekend. Yeah. You may want to try it out on a lab machine before you release them all to production. So those kinds of things. Did someone use your computer recently? Did you loan it to John? That John. Yeah, I know. What? So that he went to some place and got you about 800 viri. We had somebody bring a machine in one time, so I think it may have a virus, put an antivirus on it, rebooted it, and it went through. I think it had like 400 viruses. Holy crap. Oh, yeah. You got to be careful where you go. You can get viruses just by visiting websites, mm -hmm. by rolling the mouse over someplace uh, that you shouldn't be. That all goes back to how is your computer configured. In Windows XP, it was always my contention, the the thing I think that we get into, everybody wants it to be convenient and secure, right? That don't work. That don't work. If it's convenient, it's probably not going to be secure. 
And if it's secure, it's not going to be convenient. But in Windows XP, and that's the easy one because that was before the user account control, the default user was had what authority level? Anybody remember? XP. Administrator, right? Yeah. So that meant that you went to some place that was going to send you a virus. You didn't even have to say okay, because there was no user account control in that, right? One of the things that could help you opinion on XP machines if you're still running them, don't be an administrator, because you have what's called a secondary logon. You can right click it and run programs as run as run as administrator, so that you can do your maintenance install programs and so on without actually running as an administrator. Windows 7, the default user is an administrator, but it doesn't run with administrator authority. That's what the pop-up, when you try to install something, the pop-up comes and says, did you do this? You know, a lot of people didn't do that, and they say, yes. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. But we go back to, did somebody else use your computer? And what did they do to it if they've used your computer? Use the guest account. Use the guest account. Use a use an account with, like, no authority. Does the computer have a history of similar problems? Uh, oh, yeah, it's been doing this. It's always does it. They've been doing this for years. You know, you've had it for two weeks, or they've had it for two weeks, but it's been doing it for about three years. Does it have a history of doing these things? How are you going to find out? What are the one places that you can go to find out a little bit about the history? The event viewer. The event viewer. Go to the log files. I'm kind of a backward troubleshooter, backward whatever, but I'll try everything else, and then I go find a look at the log files, and you get in there, and it tells you exactly what's wrong, what's going on. So kind of go to those places first instead of last. Because they log files can help you out a lot. Is there important data on the hard drive that's not backed up? Here we go. This is the biggie. And this is always back up the hard drive. This is the one that if it's there, you may be able to take the hard drive out and recover the data. The operating system is something that may fail. When you think about installing things on your computer, one of the things to consider is when you install the operating system, put it on a separate partition. That way if you have to blow it away, you don't blow away all your data. If possible, have a separate physical hard drive for the data. And you guys with SSDs, I guess you probably have your operating system and page file on the SSD. Because that's where you need the speed and the data stored someplace else. Backing up. Yeah, backing up is a pain. It's slow. If you do a proper backup with tape, the tapes are not inexpensive. The tape drives are not inexpensive. One of the things that I think you should consider really is off-site. If you have a company that has multiple sites, replicate to some other location. Windows has this really cool little thing called distributed file system, which actually will replicate information from one server to the other server. It's not designed for instantaneous for like database uh, access at a different location, but it will keep your data current in a, in a new location. I use Carbonite. Carbonite works well. There's a lot, there's a lot of, there's an awful lot of places that will give you an awful lot of free storage anymore, depending on how much you're going to back up. But what you really need to maintain Here's your data. Operating system, hopefully you own. The programs, theoretically, you own. What you need is the data. That's what you don't own. <clears throat> and this, I guess, kind of goes off track, but the backup, small business backup, small businesses that don't have backups and lose their data, I think it's like 90% of them go out of business within a year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Customer information. Everybody just went away. You're a dentist, and your all your 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 database crashes, and everything goes away. You don't have any customers anymore. Can you reproduce the problem? And this is where it comes in. Something that's not reproducible really is very difficult to troubleshoot. If it can't be replicated, it becomes it becomes 
one of those that yeah it's going it's going to take a while after prior after gathering information prioritize what to do and, and diagnosing and addressing this problem netware used to have a troubleshooting test as part of their certification of course one of the things if you have two things if you have something that's going to take 5 minutes 10 minutes 15 minutes and has a 5% probability of correcting the problem and another one is going to take two and a half hours and has an 80% probability of correcting the problem, which one are you going to do first? I think the short one first. The short one first, that's exactly right. Could get lucky. It may fix the problem. Then you save your two and a half or three hours or whatever the longer one does. But do the simple stuff first. Is it plugged in? Literally, is it plugged in? Is it turned on? You'd be surprised how many of those things will fix problems. When you get into printers, try to turn it off, turn it back on, restart the printer, because a lot of stuff gets hung up, cached in printers, it just really messes things up. Or is something cached in the machine itself? Shut it down. Don't just do a restart. Shut it down and let the memory drain down. Yes? I know that with some Wi-Fi adapters, you have to cut them off, cut them fix for about 30 seconds before you cut them back on to know Some do. You always should, when you shut these things down, you want the memory to drain down. depends on how long it retains stuff, how long it, the memory retains, whatever there is. That's what places you, are yeah. off for 15-30 Yeah, you should always give the memory a chance to drain. And most troubleshooting guys say for a couple minutes, five minutes or whatever so that you're sure that all of the charge is out of the memory. So yeah, absolutely, yeah. Turn it off. Don't just restart it. Turn it off. I've heard stories where companies had to pay two, three hundred dollar service with all the hell's apparently unplugged. Yeah, stuff's unplugged. Yeah, exactly. Or it's got the wrong IP address. Something like that. You can't get to it, or somebody did something to the firewall to keep you from getting there. All of those things can affect you, but prioritize what you're going to do in these things. Troubleshooting resources, user manuals. I think Robert found the Internet is a handy source to finding books for these things, right? Yep. To take them apart, step-by-step -step instructions, so that you don't have to guess. Computers themselves... Desktop is probably not that big a deal, but when you get into laptops, you may want to look that stuff up because if you take somebody's laptop apart, they're probably not going to appreciate it if you have the pry marks on and you cracked half the case. I always find a tutorial on YouTube before I take a apart. tutorial on YouTube or a book. I mean, the manufacturers have books with pictures telling you step by step what to do. But when we take the laptops apart, I will bet that at most one, maybe two of you will bother to get the book before you try to rip that laptop apart. Okay, fully noted. We'll see, huh? Yeah, I'll be watching videos and make sure I... How many of them, look, how many of them in your class got the book? What? When they took the laptop apart? Cool. Nobody, right? I'm not doing anything in the laptop, so... Laptops are kind of a pain, but these are all the things that you can do, the user manual, internet, chat, telephone, email, manufacturer's diagnostic software that may or may not have come with the book, with the book, with the motherboard itself, technical assistance in your organization, friends, uh, blog, blog pages, internet, I guess internet we're going to, we're going to translate that into Google because it's probably where you're going to find most of the stuff. YouTube, I think Todd referred to, there's an awful lot There's an awful lot of videos on YouTube that will take you through how to do those things. Yeah. Game plan for the problems of flowchart. On the following slide is a great example. This is in the book, and I know you can't read it from there, but basically what it does is it goes down and gets you into the component area. Is it power? Is it memory? Is it video? And once you get into there, you can troubleshoot that area. But the first thing is, what area is the problem in? 
Hard drive has important data, and these are what well, we, I think we probably have considered most of this stuff. Com move to a working computer to get the important data off. If you get into the security world and you start doing forensics, the first thing you want to do is image the hard drive because you have to maintain the evidence and you work with the image, not the original data. Yeah, yeah, because you uh, inadvertent errors. One of the things that I learned the hard way that I had been told many times to do when you start messing with a file, start configuration files particularly in Linux, make a copy of it before you start. Plus, in core, I think that's one of the first things they would ask. Yeah. Because if it's been it is. at all, they throw it out. Yeah. And this is to get the thing, no need to the drive bay, return to drive to the original system. I don't they've got a picture in the book. You just plug it in and plug the power into it to get the information off of it. Post error message, we've talked about those things. You can you can get error messages on the screen, you can get error messages from the postcard if you have one of those cards. And some of the high, very high end uh motherboards come with cards with actually the chip that gives you the post errors on it it's effectively a postcard. This is the, you don't have to really install it into a bay, but note that it's laying down. Be careful on the bottom side that you've not got the, I don't really like this one, the way they've got it here, because we have metal here, and on the bottom side of this drive is a circuit board. That could be shorted. If you're going to lay it this way, that's okay, but put an insulator between the case here and the uh, and the motherboard, or you could just turn it. You could turn it over and lay and lay it on the side that doesn't have the circuit card, right? How cold uh, can it be to where a computer won't start anymore? How cold, cold can it be? I don't know. Yeah. Get, remember that the colder the better, the colder it's probably gonna like it. Okay. Well, I was just saying like temperatures like Antarctica. Condensation, it's what he said. Condensation is the issue. It'll probably work in a colder environment than you will. Because we don't really worry about cold, we worry about heat, heat dissipation. So a cold environment is someplace where you want to go. I mean, you guys were in a knock. Everybody says, oh, it's cold in here. It usually is cold in there. And it's where all the servers are. It's supposed to be cold in there for the heat dissipation. This is, and you can buy these things on the Internet if you want to, and then it showed it plugged up. You can get an adapter. You can make your own external hard drive with these things. Just have a power supply and the, the connector, uh, USB to, to whatever type of into whatever what yeah, and into whatever it is, uh, serial ATA, uh, pay, pay to, uh, some of them, I've seen several different ones. I've got one that goes to an IDE drive. Uh, some of them have duals for the full-size IDE and then for the uh, uh, laptop IDEs. So you can actually make this thing to where you can, instead of taking the case off, plugging it in, you can just plug it into your adapter and make it a, uh, a uh, USB drive. The electrical system can occur, occur before or after the boot. I mean, typically the electrical problems are going to be the inconsistent ones, and that's why back to the one I talked about, the guy with the 78-pound computer and the memory that didn't really see but appeared to, it was an inconsistent error. So everything kind of was going toward power supply and he calculated how much power each of these new elements needed and it looked like that his power supply wasn't big enough. He had 1200 1, watts power supply and he was ordering a 1600 watt power supply which wouldn't have fixed it. He calculated it wrong too and he really didn't. He only, he only needed like 800 or 900 watts on it. But can be consistent or be intermittent these things can be a problem. Uh, Possible symptoms, the PC appears to be dead. Nothing happens when you turn it on. Sometimes locks up during boot. Error codes or beeps occur during the booting. Smell burnt odors or parts, and if you've ever smelled burnt electronics, it's one that never, smell it never goes away from you. 
shuts down at an unexpected time, appears dead, except when you hear a whine coming from the power supply. I had a bad power supply on a machine at home not long ago, and it was one of those kind of, kind of sometimes it would start and sometimes it wouldn't start. But if it wouldn't start, if I would turn it completely off, disconnect it from, disconnect power from the bus and plug it back in, it would restart. Then it finally got to where it just wouldn't start. Well, that's a pretty good indicator that I have a power problem, right? Yeah. And it was, in fact, a power supply. Lots of things got power supply checking hardware that you can plug it into, check the voltages. One of the easiest ways, opinion, to check the power supply, because how many screws are in that power supply? Four. Four. Put a good one in and see if it works. Of course, if it's a motherboard problem, you may run another power supply, but power supplies generally cost a lot less than motherboards. But try those things. Our error codes, power's down at unexpected times. PC appears dead, except you hear a whine coming from the power supply. And if they start whining, that usually is an issue internally with them. Try the simple things first. If you smell burnt parts, look and see if you see if you see scorched parts. Whining, don't turn the system on, check the power connections. And the power bar that's plugged into, is it plugged in? Does it is it getting power? We're going back to that. On and on and on and on. Are the are they plugged in? And there's the wall switch one. Is the wall switch is it is the wall switch turned on? Loose cables. Circuit breakers, all the switches in the system turned on. These are things that are in the book that you can read. Older computers may be affected by EMI, electromagnetic interference. The new ones shouldn't be. They're, they're not as susceptible. In, in the good old bad old days, the government used to shield all these things before you could use those. Intermittent problems are very difficult to solve, typically. Stops or hangs for no reason. Memory errors appear intermittently. Data is written incorrectly to the hard drive. Keyboard stops working at intermittent times. The motherboard fails or is damaged. Power supply overheats. Power supply fan whines and becomes noisy. Those are the symptoms of intermittent problems. You notice it doesn't say here's the solution because you don't really know what they're going to be. Short circuit in the motherboard, and this is the one in the book they talk about and put the standoffs in mounted directly in the case. Those can be issues. And back to who was talking about the loose parts in the computer when you move it. Could be short. You guys haven't found any loose parts in these machines that the day class is taking apart, right? Oh, no. Not a single one, yeah. Yeah. Shorts in the motherboard circuits may cause problems for damage. Uh, overheating problems, hangs or freezes, the Windows famous blue screen of death. One of the problems with the Windows blue screen of death is the default says reboot on all errors. You may need to change that so that you can actually read the error. The reboot on error on errors are, to me and I don't and I read real slow. But about the time I figure out where the error number is, it restarts so I can't get the error number. You want these things to stop so you can get the error number and that that'll help you out some too. You can't hear the fan running on the power supply, and you can't feel air being pulled through there. Years ago, my son had a computer that the fan quit on the power supply. They heat up pretty fast, and they become unstable. They become erratic. Is it running? We love to make desks, and I have one at home. We love to make desks that get them out of the way, put them in this little cubby, right? Be sure that there's airflow through these things that you're not stopping that. Going to the BIOS, and this is kind of, if the system hangs, the BIOS will typically tell you, and there are other tools that will tell you what the CPU temperature is, what's reading it from the BIOS. You want to see what it is. Should not exceed 38 degrees Celsius. And a lot of this stuff is measured in Celsius. A couple of you the other night asked for some air to blow out one of the machines that you were taking apart. Be sure that 
the power supply fans claim that the heat sink hasn't collected a lot of dust, that the, that the uh, components themselves haven't collected a lot of dust. Because dirt and dust on these components will hold the heat and won't allow it to dissipate. So you do really need to keep, keep the insides of these things clean. One of the things that will help you get your computer dirty is, is setting it on carpet like these are. Because they'll pick up carpet dust. If you have a cat, if you have long-haired dogs, have long-haired dogs, all of those things. If you smoke, nicotine will put a film on all the components. Computer, has black lung. computer, well, that's that's not far from it. Computer with black lung, yep. So check the airflow. All of those other components. Have we stopped this thing? This is one. This one shows some dirt on the uh, cooler. I don't think that that's really excessive. When it when it gets clogged all the way around, now that's excessive. It's not going to do that. This this should be clean, but it's not anything. It's probably going to cause the issues. Bunnies. When you see dust bunnies in your machines, install an exhaust fan, and again, you guys with the high speed, the high end machines, do you have extra case fans? And you can put those in. Sometimes, well, they used to make, and I guess they still do, you could put a case fan in a uh, CD-ROM slot, for instance. Yeah, if you need extra ventilation, you can put extra case fans in these things. Lots of overheating, right? You probably note the machines that we're taking apart and putting together and taking apart and putting together that... And if you just look in the ones in the back there, you can see that some of them have the blanks missing where the circuit cards should be or the blank should be. Those can that those circumstances can affect so this one's got got the blank out and no circuit card in, in the slot. This one has no circuit card in the slot. You should put the blanks back in to make the airflow go the way the system was designed. These are the troubleshooting. Ensure the cables are not in the way of airflow. When you take these machines apart and put them back together, could the cables, particularly the ones with the EIDE, uh, PATA, PATA, Parallel, ATA, can those cables affect airflow? Absolutely. You may need to use twist ties to get those things up out of the way so that you can have the airflow across the motherboard itself. Verify that the cooler is connected properly to the processor. Some of you, when we took it apart, when we took them apart and you cleaned off the processors and, and put on the uh, compound, the thermal compound, a lot of them had probably a bunch of them that I saw that you saw probably had excessive thermal compound on them. It just to be a thin layer. All it is is to make good contact. A lot of dust. A lot of dirt. That yeah. Made a mess, it will. We had a guy that brought a machine in one time, and I probably may have told you this, that was so bad that I made him take it outside to start cleaning it. Wow. You know, it was bad. It wasn't just his heat sink. <laughs> the whole thing was clogged up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ceiling fan, and then you reverse it, and it's got dust all over the room, right? Unless you clean it once a week, exactly. They will collect fans. All these things are going to collect dust, and you, you really need to keep them cleaned out. This is one, after closing the case, leave the system off for 30 minutes to allow the temperature to come back down and then turn it back on and measure, measure the temperature, see what happens to it. This is a picture like we looked at with the ones back there with the, uh, with the expansion slot uncovered. One of the situations that you don't want to be. Cables, get them out of the way. These are using twist ties to get them off of the motherboard, off of the uh, off of the airways. Check the BIOS. Too many peripherals installed, and you can find out 
how much power your peripherals were taking. You may have too many peripherals installed. But with the new machines, you're probably not going to have that many installed because there aren't that many expansion slots, are there? Hmm? Everything's on the board. And the cards that take a lot of power have their own processors are typically going to have their own coolers. I'm sure your video cards have their own uh, coolers on them, their own GPU, uh, and as well as the cooler that goes on it to help that thing. Flash the BIOS using the rules that they talked about in Chapter 2, I think, maybe. Only flash the BIOS if you really need to. It's a risk reward. like everything else. If it crashes during flashing, not so good. Replace the thermal compound if it's hardened. When we took those art off the the coolers, off of the processors, how many of them? How many of you had hardened thermal compound? Yes, yeah, pretty bad one. And a lot of them, a lot of them had just a whole bunch of just you know it was very thick, and it's not supposed to be that way. It's just supposed to be a thin layer to allow complete contact. The airflow diagram on these things in front of the case, side vents, power supply, how how is it going to go? Each of them you need to figure out and that the, the, the airflow path. And I think that like on day two when we opened it up, or oh, day one when we opened up, you were supposed to look at, maybe day two, one of them, you will look at the airflow path inside of the machine. They're going to have vents on them. Mostly, they're going to wind up going out the power supply, through the power supply fan, unless you have case fans in them. And this one has a case fan in it. Vent at the bottom of the power supply. It's got a case fan here in the uh, in the system itself, so that we get that extra little bit of cooling. I guess I could have been marking these all along. See if this one works. Yeah, the case fan there. The vents in the power supply itself, and the power supply probably this is going to have a fan on it. So we got get a number of different ways to get more of the hot air out of the system. Post before before video is active. If this is, if it's getting up the screen, the screen is blank. Turn it back on. Listen for the beep codes and. Depending on the bias, you're just going to have to go look in the book, in the motherboard book, or look on the Internet and find out which manufacturer, what that beep code means. The ones that are, are kind of consistent really are video, which is a long and three shorts, I think, and memory, which is a continuous beeping. The others may or may not be different. And this is the beep during the post, the description. This is... For the Intel, it's got some award and some Intel, and I think this chart's in the book if you want to look at it. But only if you have these BIOSes will these beep codes be valid. Yes? For the continuous short beeps, is it just like or? We'll set them up. And you, and you can tell me. It's part of what the troubleshooting is going to be tonight so that you can hear some of these beep codes, what they sound like. The video on electrical, you'll get an error code on the screen itself. Error messages occur before when to start. Usually our hardware, and this says, see the table in the following slide, overclocking, and, and you, again, this is another table that you can't read from there, I know, but that's, that is, that table is in the book. Also, the Windows Boot Manager, these are one of those error things that you get that, yeah, sometimes you can see it. Actually, the, the new ones you can see a little, a little bit better. If you do not have this disk, contact your system administrator. What this is saying is Windows failed to start. Recent hardware software change might have be the cause. To fix this problem, insert your Windows installation disk. Choose a language, click Next, and click Repair Your Computer and hope. This may or may not work. I had one of the virtual machines the other day that did that, said it was going to do that. I turned it back off, turned it on, and it says, 
What do you want to do? Fix it or start Windows normally? Start Windows normally and it works just fine. Try that out too because usually the default is to go in to repair your computer. If it starts up and has both of them, always me try start Windows normally first to see if it will start. Sometimes it will. Motherboard processor starts to boot, powers down, error messages during the boot, becomes unstable, hangs or freezes at odd times. That also is a symptom of heat, isn't it? Becomes unstable and such down at odd times. So you, we get into the situation that to check these things, you may need to use some equipment with it. Since Windows Vista, there's been a memory test built into Windows that you can schedule. You can you can tell it to restart and do it. And there is one in the book that's a third party one that you can get also. If you use the Windows one, it has to restart the system and it will do the memory check on startup because it can't check it during while Windows is running. The one that comes on most Linux disks works really good. Does it? Mem test. Yeah, MemTest is one, and you can get that for Windows. MemTest 64, I think. That one works. That one is is apparently available. I I didn't get it today for a download that you can you can test the memory with, and that gives you some assurance that it writes to the memory and then reads the memory. Be careful when you do these softwares, these testing softwares. If you do disk testing software, it's when it writes to the disk and reads to the disk because if it writes to the disk, it's probably going to make what you had on the disk go away. They'll usually tell you if they're going to destroy something. Source of the problem, problem may be a virus, antivirus software. You may or may not want to trust a single antivirus software. You probably want to get one of the other ones like Malwarebytes run occasionally in addition to whatever you're using to monitor your machine with. Turn, turn the monitoring part of it off. Turn the, well, you, you, can, you can get, no, it really doesn't. It just goes through and, and tests the system. You can get a paid version or a free version of malware bytes. The free version, you like run one at a time. The paid version is like your permanent antivirus software. It's one that seems to find stuff that other, to me, that other ones really don't. What I've found most antivirus programs, they suck. Most of them, all they do is detect stuff that's already in your computer. Yeah, that's the only thing they can do. They don't do. protect it from coming in. They don't secure depends on how. It depends on how you've got it configured. There's a couple of things that you got to understand about antivirus softwares. If the virus has never been detected. It's probably not going to detect it because it has to have definitions, and that's what the updates are about: is getting the definitions for the latest viruses, the latest known viruses. The firewall won't keep you from getting a virus. No, it hasn't. What does the firewall do? Keeps other people out. So we have this firewall that I'm not going to draw my little bricks with. We have this firewall and we have the bad guys up here. What is it to stop Bad guys up here and good guys here. Now, that may because because separate ports. And somebody sends you a really cleverly crafted email. Or you go to a really cool website, and you say, "Yes, I would like that virus." Mm-hmm. Firewall didn't do you very good. What is it that stops the download? Stops like what the, download? Um, the antiviruses typically will look at a lot of the things that are not the antivirus, but the browser will look at it to see if it's to see if it's uh from a uh, well it's got a digital signature on it. And and they look at the extension. If it's an XE and it's not digitally signed, so this may be dangerous. You sure you want to do this? Sometimes 
zip files. Now, firewalls can be configured to stop certain uh, file types from coming through. You can configure it at a higher level firewall. Now, I don't want any, we, we had a problem for a while that zip files were an issue. Remember that? Zip files were just sent a virus back and forth, so we just blocked all of those zip files. You can block certain IP addresses. Years ago, they had attacks coming from, I don't know, North Korea, we'll say. So how do you fix that? You just block all the IP addresses that are in North Korea. You don't have that issue anymore. But if there's something legitimate there, you can't get it. So the problem might be a virus, antivirus software, and the antivirus softwares have to have the definitions. And that's what the updates are about. If it's a brand new virus, never been seen before, probably not going to not going to find it. Although there are some that get a little bit smarter, and some of them, depending on what you do, look at your habits and learn your habits. And if you go outside your habits, they can then stop those things from happening. But a firewall, what the firewall does is keep the bad guys from creating a connection to your machine that's on the on the inside of the firewall. And it can do filtering depending on what kind of firewall it is. We have application level firewalls. Oh golly back to networking, huh? OSI model, application layer, IP layer, layer three, layer four, where are you going to filter out? What are you going to filter? What what type of firewall are you going to be using when we talk with the, the firewall that you're talking about are layer Layer three and four, typically. An application layer firewall. We have this other really cool name for it called a proxy server. <coughs> memory module might be failing. Use the memory diagnostics and what was it MEM64, right? AJ MEM64 is a third-party one that you may want to consider getting a copy of. Check for potential hardware problems in device manager. Uh, you may want to check the log files to see if. It says that something's getting ready to fail. Download and install the Windows updates. This is this this is for you, man. All of the Windows updates got to be installed, right? One of the things, and this just may be my misperception of things, that appears to happen, particularly on servers, sometimes, is they get stupid when they get the down the updates downloaded but haven't installed them yet. So you may want to not leave them hanging out there. It's just downloaded for a long time. If after you got a new device in, uninstall the device, take it out, start over, see if that's the issue with the thing. Windows system, check the BIOS, disable quick booting features. The quick booting feature won't show you the messages during startup, and you may want to see those. Flash the BIOS if you want to. Check the CD that came with the motherboard. May have diagnostics on it. Update all the drivers for the system itself. If an onboard port's not working, verify it's not the device using the port. Onboard video, be sure it's not the cable and not the monitor, but it is the port itself. If it is the port, you can disable it. And remember, if you uninstall, it's going to come right back the next time it, you start the system. Steps, find the source of the problem, suspect the hard drive is failing, suspect the problems caused by overheating, support section of the website, verify, install processes. If we suspect it's heating, we're going to send it to Antarctica with John. So that you will know, operate in a very cool environment. Installations, and this is the one that we're kind of talking about. The guy puts in new memory, but he put in new video cards at the same time, and the machine won't start. Well, now we don't know which one's the problem. So you can take them out, install devices, install things one at a time, and then check the simple things. Power and connections, are they all there? Open the case and check for new components. Reboot the system. This is this fix all, fixes all Windows problems, right? Oh, yeah. Reboot. Reboot. Reboot the system. It does, it does fix a lot of them because memory, Windows typically will have memory degradations the longer it's on just from simple uh, power fluctuations. 
New components are getting too hot. Clean the edge connectors on memory or expansion cards blow out the dust. When you clean the edge connectors, use the proper method. They used to people used to use erasers on them. Don't do that. Yeah. If for those of you, which are probably about two or maybe three of us in here, there remember typewriters and erasers. They were they were kind of a coarse. And they would actually take stuff off, but there, there are, there's a proper way to, to do these things. Part of caused by the hard drive during boot can be caused by the system, the file system. Files required by Windows when it begins to load that are corrupted, been deleted, something happens to them, or the Windows system itself. Hard drive, check the BIOS, try booting it in another bootable media for RAID array, the firmware utility, RAID array, and, and the, the firmware here we're talking, we're talking a hardware array, not a software array that you're configuring when you do, this, when you do these things. Is it there? Uh, are all the disks good? Are there errors on any of the disks in the RAID array itself? Problems not resolve, remove and reattach all drive cables. And again, installing, reseeding can really fix a lot of problems. In the really bad old days, there was one of the IBMs, I don't remember which model it was, that had a history of thermal creep. Thermal creep means as, you, as your machine heats up and cools down, it actually backs the cards out of the slot. Well, that can happen. So thermal creep, you may need to reseat the cards. Hmm? So that's why Max solder everything. Is that why Max solder everything? Could be. I don't think so. Now, I'll open the case, use the Windows tools for checking them. And these are more and more, I think, a lot of more of the same things that we've said before in different words. FRUs. What are FRUs, Neil? You still don't know? You didn't look that up after you missed that question? <laughs> field replaceable units. Yeah. What does that mean? What's a field replaceable unit? Replacing the field. Replacing the field instead of? Something you can do yourself? I think it means you don't open it up and work on it. Field replaceable unit means you replace the whole thing. Power supply. What can you fix inside a power supply? Nothing. What can happen to you inside a power supply? You could die. Heart attack, something like that. Bad things could happen to you in power supply. So a power supply is a field replaceable unit. Receiving exchange. What about a motherboard? What can you do to fix a motherboard? Get a new one. Get a new one. Field replaceable unit. What about a processor? We could maybe we have thermal compound. We may be able to straighten a pen if it has pens, but not the new ones. I heard. I guess Todd's saying this one doesn't have pens, right? When you took a CPU yeah. out there, yeah, yeah. We we talked about when we talked about processors, the PGA and the LGA, right? Pen grid array and land grid array. Those were land. Those were land grid array processors. So the PGA, LGA. What is it? They, they've gone away from pens because. They work for years. Well, we got better and better and better at doing them because when you actually had to force them in, you could really bend them badly if you got anything misaligned at all. This says exchange hard drive for a known good, and there there is. That's a good. That's a that's an accepted troubleshooting practice, and sometimes we call it Easter egging, right? Yeah. When you replace what you think is bad with a good one. Or you could go the other way around. You could take the part out that you think is bad and put it into a system that where it has a known good one to prove whether yours is good or bad. The objective is to try to prove whether that component is good or bad. Or you could just take them all out and start all over again, right? Loud whiny drives we talked about replacing a bad power supply or motherboard might cause a disk boot failure, obviously, um, a boot disk failure. Try the easy things on the monitor, cables, contrast, brightness. Be sure that somebody hasn't turned the brightness down to zero. 
so that it's just there. There was, I digress, in, somebody was doing it, was in a, a database or a, a Word document or something like that, said, I typed my document, but I don't see it. I can't see my document. They made the fonts white on the white background. Mm -hmm. So is it there? And that's kind of like turning the brightness or the contrast down, making it look, turn the brightness down all the way where you can't see anything. I tried that on, you can try it on these monitors here. These big monitors won't go to total dark, which is kind of a neat thing, I think. Give it a shot and see. At least the one I tried wouldn't. Is the monitor power cable unplugged? Is it turned on? Uh, cable plugged into the video card. Try a different monitor. Nothing really different than any of the other troubleshooting, right? Is it plugged in, turned on? Put a, put a known good in the system to be sh to, to check it or put it into a known good system. The monitor displays post but goes blank when the window starts. The problem is windows and not the monitor. If it goes blank when windows starts, how are we going to troubleshoot that? How are we going to help us out? Help ourselves out with that one? Use the F8 key at start up and go into safe mode or VGA mode. I think there's a VGA mode and a safe mode. Safe mode loads a minimal driver set. Monitor indicators on, no image on the screen. Switch out the monitor again. Test the RAM, uh, a backup video card, put it in a good system. Is your monitor good? And, that, and that's the whole thing. Is your part good or is your part bad? The objective, find the bad part itself. LCD switch turned on. I've had this one before. That was a different class, I think. We had an instructor come in one time with his, turned his laptop on and said, I don't have any picture on the screen. When I left the house, it was okay. And when he put it into the case, he turned the monitor off. He overheated it. No, he didn't. He turned the switch off. He says, don't show me a picture. Oh. Turned the, turned the display off. Try connecting a second monitor to notebook, and some of them have VGA. A lot of them have HDMIs now instead of VGAs, I think. Is that is that the case? Poor display, resolution driver could be the monitor itself. Change the resolution to make it look what you want. Update the video drivers, what resolution will it support. Problems with CRT monitors, if you have a problem with a CRT monitor, throw it away and put <laughs> and put an L C D on it. I don't know, can anybody tell me other than fill up disk space why anybody would use a CRT monitor today? No. They're cheap. Just for They're really not cheap and they take a lot more power. No, they're cheap and they don't want to update. Oh, that could be, although they really do use a lot of power. Odd colors or blotches, EMI. We used to have, back during the days of of CRT monitors, in the library used to be a big lab where we had like 50 or 60, I don't remember how many computers in there. But that big blue box in there is a uh, power conditioner. If you set one next to it, you had nice wavy lines. You couldn't read anything on the monitor. You had to move it away. So you may get those things. They do have degaussing with them. Remember that say if you do the tour at NASA to the old mission control for the Apollo missions, they have CRT monitors. They have CRT monitors. You guys that don't watch uh, NCIS, they still occasionally set a CRT monitor on one of the desks. I mean, they have a lot of other mistakes in that program too, but that's it's like, wait a minute, that's a this year episode and they've got a, looks like a, a 1985 Mac on the desk. Maybe they do it just to see if anybody noticed. Uh, that could be, I don't know. Display settings, uh, standard VGA, VGA mode, and this is in the, in the Windows if you have a, a Windows problem. Safe mode, minimal driver set gets put into these things. And the environment, we've kind of talked about that, humidity, dust, out of control, electricity. Out of control electricity, <clears throat> I heard somebody say the word brownout a while ago. And we talked about power early on. Current 
is the issue. And a brownout, as the voltage goes down, the current, and I represents current, goes up to maintain power at the same level. And it actually goes up with a square of current. So brownouts can be really dangerous well, if you have a to high your leg system. You you're talk you're just talking about losing power. You're talking about losing a phase. You're probably gonna lose the power entirely. This is when and I think they quit doing it. They call them rolling blackouts now. For a few years they would say we're gonna brown out, we're just gonna lower the voltage. They, they did brown they do they did do brownouts. They have rolling blackouts now. Yeah. Brownouts are really hazardous to your Equipment's health. Yeah, they used to do that in the building in the summertime. Brown out. Everyone had their yeah. air conditioners the on. And then they had to replace all those starting capacitors, didn't they? Because the compressors wouldn't start because they killed all the start capacitors on the so air conditioners. This is one that actually does have quite a bit of dirt in it when you look at those things. When you blow out... One of these little fans, it's really nice, it's really kind of cool. You're going to blow a fan on and it goes, wee. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. Put a no. pencil in here. Don't go wee because if you go wee, you're probably going to burn the bearings up. Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> Taking all the fun away, huh? Protect the equipment high temperatures. I think it, it, we covered most of these things, except for, and we alluded to this one with John's question that Josh talked about. Don't take it from a cold environment into a warm environment, turn it right on because you're going to get condensation. Water is not, water inside your computer is not good while the power is on. Probably not. Probably not. If you get it wet, just be sure it's dried out before you turn the power on. They, they can get wet, but high humidity can be an issue. Don't leave it turned on for weeks or months at a time. I don't know. I don't know that that's necessarily what you want to do or not do in today's environment because most of these things go to sleep and really don't aren't running anything after they've been on for a little bit of time. And servers run consistently, consecutively for years, not just weeks. Well, if it doesn't, then you get a new one that will. Keep a record book. Keep track of what you do. You may or may not have experienced this. I do stuff to a computer, and my wife two weeks later says, this doesn't work. Did you do something to the computer? No. And then, that's two weeks ago, and then a couple hours later, oh, yeah, I did that then, and this is the first time it's actually been tested. Didn't write it down. Keep track of what goes on on the system themselves. How to dispose of used equipment, uninstall the applications, Zero fill utility. Destroy the hard drive. Destroy all the data on the hard drive is the real is the real issue. These things should all go to some place to proper disposal because there are a lot of things in them that are hazardous to the environment. And I know you thought I wasn't going to get here tonight, but I wanted to get here so you could take a break and then we could go back and do this stuff. Questions. So, what is one of the keys to troubleshooting? One key to troubleshooting. Start simple. Do I got to start over? Start, start. start simple. Do the simple stuff first. Listen to the listen to whoever it is, and sometimes you're going to have to question them about, well, how did that really happen? What really happened there? Kind of deal. And you may have to go and observe what's going on with these things. Well, you have some issues, some stories. Reboot the system. And what, when the tech finally, when nothing was happening, when the tech finally was restarting real fast, when the tech finally went and watched them reboot the system, what they were doing was turn the monitor off and turn it back on. <laughs> wow. So you may have to be a little more explicit on those things. If Questions? I remember, if I remember seeing the stuff, did they still say most of the problems start at the physical end? That's what they used to say. Yeah, they don't really start that, they don't really say that anymore. Just be sure that 
the basic stuff, the real simple stuff is done, that the power that is plugged in, turned on. That sounds like, oh, yeah, I can never do that. I can never not do that. Well, guess what? You can. Questions? No. Take a break. I know you were waiting for that one, right? <laughs>